welcome again to this afternoon's panel on Buddhism, race, and multiple religious belongings. I am Tajay Bongsa, an alum of this school and a project assistant at Religions and the Practice of Peace Initiative. We introduce the panelists in the morning, and I'm grateful for the opportunity to introduce this panel's moderator, Professor Janet Gatso. She is a very loving and caring human being. <laughs> <laughs> professor Janet Gatso is the Hasi Professor of Buddhist Studies and also the Associate Dean for Faculty and Academic Affairs at the Harvard Divinity School. Her writing has centered on Tibetan Buddhism and its cultural and intellectual history from the perspective of large issues in the humanities about human experience and its literary presentation. Current and previous topics of her scholarship include animal ethics, sex and gender in Buddhist monasticism, the current female ordination movement in Buddhism, visionary revelation in Buddhism, lineage, memory and authorship. The philosophy of experience and autobiographical writing in Tibet. Professor Janet Gatso is the author of Being Human in a Buddhist World, an intellectual history of medicine in early modern Tibet. She is currently teaching a class named Forms of Life, Buddhist, Buddhist Ethics for a Post-Human World. Now, I would like to hand over the floor to Professor Janet Gatso. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you Taj to Tajay. That's a very lovely uh, introduction, very, very nicely said. Thank you. It's, I'm really happy to be here, and I'm sorry that I missed uh, the morning session, but I hope to get into the swing of where you're all at. But I heard it was actually very good and very fruitful for many of you. So I'm going to make a couple of brief comments, and then... Um, as I was asked to do by the organizers, and then we'll hear from the panelists, that the uh, organizers did ask me to talk a little bit um, about myself as well. Uh, but first I'm gonna read the questions for the uh, afternoon, uh, which were written by the organizers. So, um, how is it useful to think about racial identities and multiple religious identities intersecting? Uh, how does race factor into insider-outsider dynamics of belonging in your religious communities? Looking at the intersection of Buddhism with other religious traditions in terms of race, what has been your experience? And how do you engage with questions of cultural appropriation, questions of authenticity, such as in some kind of idea of real Buddhism? So those are the questions that were put to the panel. And this is a very, um, I'm not sure how relevant it is to the questions. I'll just say a few things and I'm happy to talk further uh, as the discussion goes on. Um, uh, I'm just really glad to have this opportunity. I myself have been thinking, and so I'm a professor of Buddhist studies and I focus on Tibetan Buddhism but very happy to have this opportunity to raise issues around race and intersectionality just because if for no other reason than they've been very much on my own mind these days, maybe in the past few years, obviously both uh, because of um, events and the way things are unfolding in our country and all kinds of issues that have arisen you know, almost every day is a very, very critical and often very troubling issue. Uh, and I would say also, uh, as I'll just say briefly, um, in my own personal experience, issues around these kinds of issues around belonging and identity are very much part of my own history. And I would say um, I also feel that the that the questions that the questions that get raised around this sometimes bring us to the heart of some very very important issues in ethics and living together in our contemporary period. So I feel like it's sometimes it's a difficult discussion and there's reasons for why it can be a difficult discussion, but I think it's worthwhile 
uh, trying to have it as much as possible. And we, some of us have to go out a little bit on thin ice in order to try to explore how we're going to communicate around these issues. I will say that I was recently a part, so I'm working on animal studies right now, and at the American Academy of Religion, there has recently, there was recently a panel on issues around history of race, especially in the United States and animal studies. And I brought some of the issues that were raised there uh, to my class recently. We had a fantastic discussion. I won't go into it now, but if people want to talk to me later about it, about, you know, um, I'm actually not sure that I think that race and animal issues should be brought together. Other people think that it's very important too, given the history, but I can talk more about that later. Um, but let me just tell you something about myself. I have had, first in terms of multiple religious belongings, so I was born in Philadelphia, United, um, Pennsylvania, uh, as in a, <laughs> okay, uh, <laughs> a Jewish, very Jewish family. Uh, and raised by a, a quite religious mother and a father who was very skeptical about religion more generally, so this kind of strange mix between the two different parents, but a very strong Jewish identity. And, uh, and then at a very critical point in my life, I encountered uh, Buddhism and uh, Buddhist people and was extremely moved by uh, Buddhist teachers, especially Tibetan teachers that I was fortunate enough to meet. And I would say that, you know, in, in terms of identity, I would say I'm definitely Jewish. I'm very Jewish culturally. I'm very, not necessarily totally buy into all dimensions of Jewish theology, uh, but culturally Jewish, uh, very much so. And was raised in a community which was maybe 85% Jewish in Northeast Philly. Uh, and I also will, I'm very, I can say I'm a Buddhist as well, although that too is complex in the way that I think of myself as a Buddhist. Um, I, most fundamentally, I don't really care about identity issues in either case. I mean, I realize that they're important and they come up all the time, but for me, it's not personally a problem. Certainly to be both Buddhist and Jewish, I, I don't even know exactly what that means. I'm not trying to make everything consistent in my life. I'm very, very moved by the great teachings I've gotten in Buddhism. They've helped me live my life in really, really important ways. And I'm, you know, I'm dyed in the wool, Jewish, Ashkenaz. In fact, one of my relatives just had a, a you know, their gene thing tested. And I'm pretty sure that I'm like 99.9% .9 Ashkenazi, you know, Eastern European Jew. Um, secondly, there, I will say, and this is probably a slightly more complicated part of what I w want to say, is around being white. And um, it's, it's something of a, I'm, I, I don't feel totally settled, at, well, I don't think anybody does, around this issue. But personally, you know, because, you know, I am white, I look white and stuff, uh, but, you know, white supremacists don't recognize me as white. So Jewish people are not white for white supremacists. I will also say that in our community, um, we didn't think in terms of who's white and who's not white, but we did think in terms of who's Jewish and who isn't. We thought of ourselves as this very definite community and the rest of the world are goyim, which is a Jewish word, and it means outsider. But when we said that, you know, although it, it technically means an outsider, but it, 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 we meant it primarily about, I would say, white Protestants in the United States. That's the way we saw it. I don't, you don't usually use the word goyim for uh, African Americans, for example. It's just not the same category. And so there's a sense in which we also have a conception of white, but, you know, in my, in my experience, especially growing up, and I went to college and university, and then I found myself in academia, and uh, especially because I was hired at first at Amherst College and now at Harvard University, uh, both places that, um, you know, when my parents first came to visit me at those places, they said, whoa, you know, this is a really goyish place. And it was like a place that we don't belong. A generation ago, we were discriminated against for, you know, you couldn't really become a faculty member very easily or even come to Harvard as a Jewish person, I think, in the beginning of the 20th century and so on. And yet, 
there's ways in which I pass, and I am white, and I have very much enjoyed the benefits of being white enough, probably. It's very complicated. And so now that these issues are coming up, I have, I have really mixed affiliations, and I don't really know what side of the line I stand on, and, um, and you know, sometimes I want to say I don't have to look at myself, and in other times I recognize that I absolutely do, but it's just different ways that you locate yourself depending on what angle you're looking at it from and what the issue at hand is. So it's a, just a very complicated issue. Um, I'll say that, you know, I, I certainly have find it um, hard sometimes to feel like I really fit in at a place like Harvard University, even though I manage, I look like I feel that I do, and, you know, I've been in this business for a long time, so I look like I'm very, very confident and stuff like that, but it, it, is, a, it is a slightly odd misfit feeling. For me, the, the, the name of the game always is complexity, no, not feeling 100% confident, no, not feeling 100% safe, but you try to make your way the best you can and try to be, to use maybe that experience in the best possible way. Um, so I'm going to just leave my own comments at that. I mean, there's a way in which I want very, and part of my issues around animals and humans is I really feel that issues around race are a very, very human issue, and 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 it's it's I I really long to connect to other human beings in I don't care if they're other races or the same races or other religions or the same religions. I I long to connect to human beings, and I. I, I feel an attraction and also compulsion to connect with people who are very different than me. And I think that's why I was so attracted when I first saw Tibetan Buddhist teachers. And I was just like blown away, A, by what they were saying as teachers, but also their mannerisms, just the way they held themselves. I don't know if that's an issue of race or not. It's certainly an issue of culture. But for me, it, it was, you know, and still remains a, a kind of aspiration to connect at a human level, to, to not to dissolve difference, but in spite of difference, also to be able to connect in a human way. So that, and I did, in fact, my latest book, my last probably book or whatever, but uh, is called Being Human in a Buddhist World. So that's how much I think it, being human is important. These days I'm talking about the post-human, but that's only so we can include animals and the rest of the planet. So I'll just leave my comments at that. That's me. And uh, then I think we'll just, uh, are, do we, are we going in a very particular order here with, so would anyone like to begin with their own comments, which you have more time than I just took um, on these issues? Would you like to start? Uh, so actually I'll read this first. <laughs> you remind me what to You want me to read one. them again? No, you can read them one at a time. And oh, okay. We can Okay, so uh, first one is, how is it useful to think about racial identities and multiple, excuse me, multiple religious identities as intersecting? So for a lot of us, it's not an issue. It is our, it is our life when we have some kind of spiritual experience. And just because I'm introduced to something new does not erase the experience that, that I had. So for those of us who have had some direct experience, if somebody else read about something in a book and said, I don't believe that, well, what does that have to do with us? And so, so I can hold fast to my Christian uh, uh, experiences because they are, they are real. Mm -hmm. And when I come in to encounter something in the Dharma, uh, then if it's like the experience that I had in my Christian experience, well, then I had the experience before I understood what it was. I just love Buddha because he made it plain for me. He let me know this is what happened. That's what that was. And so <laughs> when they were saying, oh, well, it's the gift of God, it's the this, it's that, Buddha, Buddha began to like just lay it out, and that's what it was. I used to be a Taoist, and, and I love Taoism, you know, such high, lofty sayings. And my Taoist master took me to a Buddhist uh, Monastery, and that's how I became a Buddhist and ordained that. He said, Buddhism is for you. I said, I was asking too many questions. He said, Buddhism is for you. And I said, No, no, I looked at that. I'm not interested in that. He said, No, that's for you. You know, and I'm so grateful because he sent me back to kindergarten because Buddha was interested in making it plain for us. Uh, and, uh, 
And so throughout my time as a Buddhist, I've always encountered uh, the, the Jesus or the God question. What, what, you know, what did you do with, with Jesus and what did you do with God? I didn't do anything with him. You know, I just let everything be, let everything be what it is. But, you know, just looking for some point of comfort because they found something in the Buddhist tradition that was useful, but it was not what they were taught within another tradition. And the question is always, then what do you, what do you do with that? I said, you know, God's a big boy. He can take care of himself. You know, he doesn't need, he doesn't need our praise, our worship, our adoration. He doesn't need our defense. He doesn't need any of, any of those things. But what he did say is if, you know, you asked for something, would your parent give you something less than that? He said, then how about me? You know, if you ask me for good gifts, I will give you good gifts. And so I can understand that I was asking for something. And I found my answer in what somebody called Buddhism, but it was the answer I was seeking while I was on that path. And so now that I'm clear, I just keep going. That's why I don't call it a this or a that. Well, I do, but, but I don't really mean it. You know, I mean, it's just a point of reference. So, you know, if we come in here, we're not going to be talking about that. We're going to be talking about this. Nevertheless, the thread runs through, through all of it. So it's been easy for me, you know, when I became a Theravadan, they were like, well, first of all, women can't be ordained. ordained. Well, what? You know, a, a monk ordained, now I'm ordained. Then the nuns come back and, and they say, well, you know, you need to be reordained by me. No, I don't. You know, well, you know, and so they want me to reordain again under them. And I'm like, no, no need. I already have it now. Uh, and, and then when I went to Thailand, they said, well, it's against the law for women to become monastics. Uh, it's not possible. And I got 55 nuns over there. But I just went and started ordaining. If I ordain them, they are monastics. You know, so you can't say they don't exist. You might not acknowledge them, you know, but they are there. And in time, you know, when sometimes it just takes a changing of the guard. When the old ones die, the young ones are all for it, and the thing changes. And so sometimes we just have to be patient and wait. Um, when I first started, I can't do some things because I'm in the deep south. When I got there, the first thing they did was sent me a news article, and it was, the devil has come to South Carolina. You know, now that wasn't a story about me. That was just to give me a, a hit, you know, a 411. <laughs> they said, the, the devil has come to North Carolina. And it was about a Cambodian uh, Buddhist community. Mm -hmm. So, you know, they were saying what they wanted to say. Mm -hmm. And again, I felt like, what does that have to do with me? Sometimes we do have to be courteous to others, though. Mm -hmm. Recognizing where they are, what their mindset is. And if you ever want to have an opportunity to bring more understanding, then you have to meet them where they are. Not with fear, but just with, under, just with understanding. You don't have to throw something in their face, but you just keep doing what you're doing, keep being who you're being, in, and you know, or like casting bread on the water. And after many days, it returns. Now I've been there 16 years, you know, and I'm a fixture there. Um, but it didn't happen overnight. I didn't force it. I didn't push it in their face. And I didn't keep starting over. We can't keep starting over. We have to keep going. Well, I guess uh, there's many places to start. We talk about um, double belonging, and I just want to pay homage to um, a monk in our tradition, Brother Feb Day who was a Catholic priest before he was a stockbroker and came back in 67 to be ordained a monk. And his name, Day, means younger brother. So uh, Ty was able to see and to, that named her, help remember, to be humble. And he was young in mind and heart. And Ty charged him with the idea of helping people to recognize that we have multiple roots of everything. And he referred to the religious or spiritual one as double belonging, what we call multiple belonging. And he, could, he would fill halls of people of every stripe who were grappling with 
their inherited religious root or spiritual root and what they were drawn to, whether it was Buddhism or something else. And at first he didn't want to do it. But our teacher encouraged him. People need to know where they came from. And if you meet something new, you don't abandon a root. It's painful. You embrace it. You understand it. You heal it. And by way of uh, not cutting it off, because you can't. Our teacher, among many, is famous for saying, you know, the son is always in the father, and the father is always in the son, and mother and daughter, et cetera, et cetera. And even though we think we're cutting them off, we're not. We're just cutting off some part of ourselves. So, you know, I'm born, and by the time I'm born, my parents had converted from being Baptist to Catholic. And my other grandmother lived as a domestic and worked for an Irish Catholic priest, who I grew up thinking was my grandfather, till I knew better when I was older. That wasn't right. Couldn't be. <laughs> that was probably my first seed of this thing that now manifests as a monastic. And um, I went through school, Catholic school, my whole life. And I'll never forget the Sundays that my mother would wake us up. Come on, time to get up and go to church. Oh, Mom, I'm tired. I don't, I don't want to go. Get up and go. Don't, 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 don't you be lazy. But I say the nun said that God is everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> and if God is everywhere, I don't need to go to church. Get up out of that bed. But these were like early musings, early, and I didn't even know that then. I can look back on it now with insight, you know? And I started to seek to learn other things because I did not align with the doctrine of the Catholic Church. Catholicism is beautiful, but the folks who were mm, interpreting it uh, had different views. And so I looked and I saw and I, many things, and after many years came to Buddhism and ultimately became a nun. And my father was a stalwart Catholic. You know, when you, I saw that when you convert to something even more so than those who were born with it, right? And so when I became a nun, he wasn't quite sure. And he'd say to my sibling, is the cult she's being brainwashed? Mm -hmm. They said, no, Daddy, no, 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 it's all, it's all okay. And I would come home and I would visit and I'd always surprise him so he never knew when I was coming. And he'd be so happy to see me. And I never talked about Buddhism. I didn't push anything on it. Mm -hmm. If he had a question, I'd answer it, but he never really did. But I, all along I was, reconciling within myself mm. these things. And so I had an insight. And one day I sat down with him and I said to him, Daddy, I just want to let you know how grateful I am that you exposed us to the spiritual life. I didn't always want to go to church. I went to Catholic school my whole life right on through university. But I'm deeply grateful because it prodded me to ask questions and to look more deeply. Mm -hmm. And there was a time when I was angry at the church too now, mm -hmm. and Christianity and all the things that we know we see manifesting around us today. But I didn't want to let that stop me from really finding a spiritual home. And so I said to him, I said, Daddy, I just want to thank you. Because you and Mama, he worked at the post office. She was a nurse. You all worked hard to put all six of us through school and college if we chose. Mm -hmm. And I'm grateful for that dimension because now I sit here and I'm really happy and I'm helping a lot of people. And I'm grateful to you for that. And he 
just like, I can see that you're happy. And I'm happy too. Now, no argument, no pressure, no pushing, just sort of, as I'm able to get it myself, was able to have insights to share, to help another receive, and just be open. And I feel lucky because many in my tradition, you know, it's, it's difficult with their parents. And things. So being able to sort of um, have that, 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 that double, multiple belonging, because I was, I was interested in everything, in every, every religion, every spiritual dimension. I like to take a little piece of this, a little piece of that. And it's okay. And it's okay. And then I remember Ty and Dr. King. And Ty, the, the few occasions he met Dr. King and what they each did in their own spheres to build beloved community. And he, he was quoted as saying that he learned to love Jesus through Dr. King. And Dr. King learned a thing or two from his relationship with Ty. And hopefully this is what we can, uh, we can, uh, I, when I say strive for, I mean maybe I should say thrive for, when we want to uh, engage and entertain for, for our, our, our nourishment and the nourishment of others. And to find that place of, uh, non-judgment and non-discrimination. It takes a lot of work and none of us are perfect at it. But we get glimpses and those glimpses are sustaining. Hello. Um, thanks for being here. I can share two stories about religious or spiritual transition for myself, um, which resonate and echo with Venerable Panyawati um, and Sister Peace. Just, I so appreciate your like gentle fearlessness, like both of you have emanate this really amazing courage, and I appreciate it. I grew up an arrogant atheist um, in a family that uh, was so bought in to knowledge as the ticket up and out that they tried to amputate a lot of spiritual faith connection. Not entirely, my mom my mom's Jewish identity was important to her, especially in terms of um, justice and resisting injustice. The, the religious and spiritual dimension was less so. Um, but I grew up, I, I mentioned this morning, she was also the head lawyer of Planned Parenthood of California, so I grew up seeing her fighting Christian fundamentalists mm -hmm. and fighting the homophobia, the misogyny, the racism, you know, all these things that, that you were alluding to that make us feel very betrayed by religious institution. Um, so I didn't really want any part of that. And it seemed to me from both my parents' life stories, each of them kind of had a quintessential American dream, supposedly, experience that actually reveals a lot about systemic oppression. Um, but my dad was born in 1940 in segregated New Haven, Connecticut, and was one of the first beneficiaries of affirmative action and went to Yale at 16, where he encountered cherry bombs in the bathroom and couldn't play on the baseball team and these different kinds of experiences, right? And yet, to him, again, knowledge and education was the ticket out, was the ticket for class ascendancy, professionalization, um, and it felt good. Like, it felt good to learn about the world and for him to have different kinds of experiences and, and what his parents wanted for him. Um, 
So this multiple belongings question, I think, is really interesting also in terms of American identity or what it means even to have an identity of being a successful individual in this neoliberal global capitalist world, right? Um, like what is, I thought as an arrogant atheist that like if you could just get it all together in your life and maybe pass some progressive policies that help a lot of people, then you're good, <laughs> you know? Um, and I came to Harvard as an undergrad, so I was at the undergrad campus and there's a gate at that campus with this inscription that says, enter to grow in wisdom, depart to better serve thy country and mankind, something like that. And this made me so skeptical, because I was like, what wisdom are they teaching inside of here, you know? I was here between 2004 and 2008, so I witnessed the pipeline of seniors graduating from undergrad going to Goldman Sachs, Morgan Stanley, all over Wall Street, which then facilitated the financial crisis, the housing crisis, foreclosures that disproportionately impacted black families across the country in one of the largest thefts of wealth from black communities ever in the US. And I'm like, this is better serving our country and mankind. This is what we're being trained and prepared to do. So I was really hungry for wisdom. I was like, this can't be what wisdom is. I was really starting for it. My first uh, elective class in undergrad was on Indo-Tibetan Buddhism. And I'm sure it was great for some people, <laughs> but to me, it was just like dry as sawdust, and it was not speaking to the heart questions that I had or the practice questions. So I kind of let alone and set it aside until I graduated college and was feeling lost and vulnerable. And I think lost and vulnerable is an especially good place to be for a spiritual openness <laughs> and humility, right? Because the answers that we're seeking might not end up look like anything that we thought that they would. Um, it's also interesting to keep that in mind as an activist because we can become so convinced of our own perspectives as organizers, as activists, as people who are constantly gaslighted by the system, which is telling us like, no, it's really no big deal, just be patient, it'll, you know, nah, nah, nah. it's not really that bad. Um, so, so there's a lot of tension and a lot of push and pull, I think, in the social justice community about how do we maintain a wide and open heart while also not buying into some of the bullshit of the status quo um, that would continue to further harm. So my first sort of spiritual transition ended up being at Cambridge Insight Meditation Center, which was a um, predominantly white space at the time. Um, but I was able to stay there for two reasons related to kind of intersectionalities and, and belonging. So one was that the first Dharma teacher that I saw give a Dharma talk was a black man um, who's a really beautiful, George Mumford. Yeah, yeah, so beautiful. Just his presence, you know, and his embodiment. So that really helped me stay. Um, and the other, I'm ashamed to say, was because of some of my internalized Western European rationalist enlightenment white supremacy, the relative absence of what I perceived as devotional practice made me feel more comfortable, like, oh, this is a space for people who are intellectual, or you, know, you don't have to believe in things in order to do this practice. You just have to try it, and it's very scientific. And again, I want to own up to the ways that I had internalized a lot of the anti-Asian white supremacy that sees devotional forms of Buddhism as cultural baggage or as superstitious or as um, that infantilize these practices, right? So I had to kind of just get over myself eventually. It took many years. I'm grateful for a lot of teachers on the path. And then the second spiritual transition that I had was much more recent. 
and I'm still really processing it, which is that, so I first entered in a Theravada insight tradition coming through, it was both like CIMC, so like Burmese and Thai, and then also in the Goenka schools, which I entered predominantly because they were like free. <laughs> um, and, and I loved like the service dimension of it too. I served a lot of courses and lived on the campus. Um, but one thing that I have been challenged on in the current Rinzai Zen uh, tradition that I'm studying, which is a much more martial arts focus, we do um, sword fighting, we do archery, all kinds of other practices. And the teacher's like, okay, you know how to like sit on your individual cushion and meditate or you know, be on your own mat, but I, you can cultivate your immovable mind in this tradition through fighting, in the midst of fighting. You have to also be able to keep it while you're engaging another person. Um, and I think that's been a really hard, actually, and useful kind of bridge between how so much of my life and my energy is spent thinking about systemic issues and systemic oppression, and how do I as an individual fit in with these historic and global systems, or it's like introspection and looking at my own, you know, this karma, this, these habit patterns. But to do it interpersonally in a, in a responsive way, oh, it's so hard. It's so hard. And it's opened me up to the very sneaky ways that ego latches on to activist identity, including a deep fear of hurting others, like fear of messing up, to the point that it becomes like a lot of self-cherishing. Like, oh, I can't make a mistake. I can't hurt anyone. Mm -hmm. Or a need, a desire to overconsume news of other people's suffering so that I feel like a good person who's in the know mm -hmm. about what's happening in the world. Even if I can't, the news about it doesn't help me serve anything. It just, but I f can taste that. Mm, like, I want to be a good revolutionary, so I need to know. <sighs> so those are my very um, lay persons, <laughs> like average person trying to, trying to figure out how to live this life and still very much in process. Um, but again, grateful, yeah, for all for the many beings and many bodies um, who have made these practices possible, and for the many beings and many bodies who are continuing to allow the practices to unfold and include more and more and more people in them. Thank you. Thank you. There is a chime that I was given as a gift in a time of struggle which reads, there is no set path, just follow your heart. Mm -hmm. And this saying has guided me with a lot of wisdom in some really hard times. Yeah. I first came to Buddhism in part because I was frustrated with the racism that I was experiencing as a pre-tenure faculty person mm -hmm. and working with colleagues who seemed to simply not be able to see me as a person and as a body. Not only did they not see me, but they actually couldn't validate the content that I was hired to teach. So there is an erasure of the importance of black liberation theology, all of the black liberation theology, the troll tradition. There is a minimalization of womanist thought and no one knew who Patricia Hill Collins even was. So in my attempt to actually teach these particular thinkers and these traditions, it was the feedback from colleagues that my teaching was poor and that the content that I was teaching was unnecessary. <laughs> that drove me, as Alice Walker says, 
out of my mind. In my tradition, the African Methodist Episcopal Church, we had also been encountering acts of racial violence in churches such as Charleston and Dylan Ruth. So the varieties of traumas that I was experiencing around race were quite significant. All in the great state of Texas. So when I got a call to come to Harvard to work with Janet and Charlie, I thought, whoa, this is the ticket. This is the path out. That was several years ago. I'm grateful because those friendships have actually paved a way for me to survive and to thrive. And to also see that institutions that we are often called to are not perfect, but it doesn't negate the call. And that institutions can be changed and transformed over time. And as wisdom was just shared today over lunch, not to give up on your vision and your call to educate, to make a difference, to do social justice, to wrap this all together, in part because of the blocks that are set right before you, or in some cases, the institutions that seem to be blocks right before you. I can say, honestly, after 15 years at being at this wonderful institution in Texas, I have actually seen a change and a major transformation. And a part of that transformation came by coming to courage in the Buddhist tradition and becoming a practitioner of meditation and finding the courage to then introduce an academic program such as the first African American studies program at TCU. So diving into the courage enough to teach African American and Africana history in a space where it may not have been even envisioned by the founders that such a thought and discourse was possible. I'll share also that I serve as a Christian minister, an ordained minister in the African Methodist Episcopal Church. So that the reality of Charleston and racial violence in faith spaces hits home for me deeply. It was in that same church that I, Sunday after Sunday, watched my father, God bless him, fall asleep every Sunday at the sermon, during the sermon, and wake up <laughs> after the sermon at our dinner table, ready to challenge me about the theological <laughs> precepts and frames that were in the sermon. <laughs> My mother, raised in a Baptist tradition, was told very early that she could not be ordained because she was a woman. And so the reality of sexism, in the Christian tradition at least, was introduced into my life very, very early as a form of silencing of my mother and my aunts and the women in my family. So that when I actually became ordained much later as her daughter, I was the first woman to be ordained in our family. My mother, about a decade later, became the second. <laughs> Sometimes the daughter paves a way for the mother. Sometimes the son paves a way for the father. And the intergenerational reality, I think, of, of my story is important in part because the healing is important 
sometimes millennials are the one healing their ancestors. Because they actually have the courage to be able to move from all of these different identities, whether they're religious identities or racial identities, and they have the courage to live in a different reality, to live into multiple belongings. I'll say finally that I did find God in the face of friends and peace in a moment with the Buddha. And I wasn't expecting the Buddha. I was expecting Jesus. <laughs> I really was. I really was. And so, and I also have the gift of being of a generation on our panel, which is so beautiful to see so many generations, of having access to the work of Alice Walker. So she had already written, right, and gone through so much and was able to write about it. So that's what I studied growing up. I, are, I am a privileged uh, recipient of the work of Jan Willis, a black Baptist Buddhist. So this kind of expression and freedom to double belong in the first place had already been uh, presented to me. And that's significant for those um, in my generation and also in generations just after mine, in part because some of the confessional, some of the hits, so to speak, have already been taken. So we actually just find ourselves very freely moving from a spirituality to spirituality with the freedom to study and speak and talk in multiple languages, uh, sometimes unaware that it was really difficult for women in the first generation to be the only woman at the, in the table, at the table or in the classroom. It was very difficult to be the only Christian in a Buddha Sangha and to have to not speak of one's Christian identity uh, for fear of what it might be and how it might be perceived, either in that sangha or by their church. Uh, there are many of us who actually embody double and multiple religious belongings who just didn't have to fight those fights, so we actually live in a kind of freedom now. That freedom is called many different names. Um, and one way the womanist tradition and womanist scholarship really calls it is fluid spirituality really being able to recognize that one's religious and spiritual life ascends and descends and ebbs and flows throughout one's life journey, that it's very much more like a spectrum than a linear process, and that this is okay, and that this is actually good. And yes, one does it with accountability, and one does have to be careful about cultural appropriation, but that always one returns in an African cosmological sense back to the blood, back to who you are and your own identity and where you identify your own spiritual ancestry as well as your ancestors. So for Alice Walker, and, and it is the case uh, as it turns out for me as well, it's significant that her racial identity, she draws on three lineages, African American, white, and Native American, particularly Cherokee. I also happen to have the same blood lineages in addition to Blackfoot, Native American. So when I go to my sitting mat and come to a space of the view and I feel held by spiritual ancestors and connect with that love that's holding me so that I might be able to deepen, I'm held by those peoples, those spiritual ancestors who also have particular religious and, and also racial identities which are significant for me in where I am in my own consciousness. Now I have recently just been with family through a crisis. We've had, uh, I have a three-year-old niece who um, is healing now, thankfully, from pneumonia. And it caused a moment of radical self-love and radical family love and radical love in part because we're also in the process of saying goodbye to a cherished aunt. So these paradoxes are at play just right now in my family. And also all of the different issues that can emerge when one is moving through family crisis. Well, they pray in the name of Jesus, so I don't know if I can pray with them because, or, 
Well, I think she meditates. Does she pray in the name of Jesus? I don't think she, should we call her or not? And then finally, you know, the wisdom of my mother and the wisdom of, of that occurs right there in the moment. Just everybody, just send good love, okay? <laughs> just, this is, this, the reality is the baby gotta be healed. So, <laughs> whatever you practice, practice something. But that's a good piece of wisdom, and, and Alice Walker has said the same thing. If one is an activist particularly, one is conscious on any level about justice in our time, you need a practice, something to hold you. We need a practice, community, something to hold us. Well, thank you everyone for such thoughtful, deeply observed things that you've shared with us. And we have plenty of time now for conversation. And uh, I'm happy to open to the floor to see if anyone would like to, in particular, address any of the speakers or raise a more general question and we can try to have a conversation together. Does that sound right? So do we have a mic? Oh yeah, we do. So anyone would, would like to raise a question or uh, be involved in some kind of uh, conversation carrying forward what we've already been talking about? ask a question. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> this was something maybe that was more directly tied to the last panel. Um, uh, I see some familiar faces from our workshop on embodiment in the practice, um, the first fi foundation of mindfulness, um, mindfulness of the body that happened last Saturday. Um, and something that the teacher shared was uh, a study that um, people who practice meditation in the U.S. have like um, same or worse ability to like sense into their bodies than people who don't practice meditation at all. And, and I was thinking about that in relation to whiteness and like being disconnected from like, I actually don't have awareness of what's going on in my body right now. Um, so I was just curious around like, uh, and please if this is like, Come on, that was last <laughs> last panel. Um, but I'm curious about your practice. I like you shared some of your practices around like embodiment and really understanding the body as part of liberation <laughs> necessarily. Um, but I wonder if if you have any more uh, wisdom to share around like embodied practice and calling others into um, like we're bodies. <laughs> mm. um, yeah. That's it. Thank you so much. An interesting question. I don't know, maybe each of the panelists might like to address it, mm -hmm. very specifically about embodied practice and bodily practices that you find are helpful. I'll start. Um, oh, these are working. Ah, magic. OK, good. Um, it is the afternoon, and I know that we are all feeling the glories of our lunch. <laughs> so I'm going to bring a little humor into our space so as to uh, keep us uh, embodied. <laughs> Don't tell my son, but I drank his breakfast this morning. I'm breastfeeding, and what that means is that the body becomes full if no one is eating breakfast. I found myself this morning in a bit of a quandary because I was full, but my son is at home. Who was going to eat the breakfast? It's so full of nutrition, 
and so full of vitamins. And rather than pour it down the drain, wouldn't it just be better to mix it with my coffee? You asked for it in <laughs> It is significant that I also do work on the sacred blood of uh, African American bodies, uh, lynched bodies. Mm -hmm. And to me, milk and blood um, that have been soaked into Earth Mother is important for us to look, the mingling of all of these nutrients is important for us to look at. We are not just beings, racialized beings. We are not just bodies, but we are bodies in inside of bodies. Mm -hmm. And it's important to recognize that that kind of understanding of embodiment can often come through an intersectional lens. And so this is also um, significant in terms of the first panel, but also beginning with uh, Kimberly Crenshaw. It is the case, I think, that the gift and challenge of these conversations, particularly this panel, which is all um, multiple genders, but also um, perceived, could potentially be perceived as single gendered women, on International Women's Day mm -hmm. is revolutionary. This would not have been possible uh, at Harvard 50 years ago. Embodying that and breathing that in, I think is also significant and important. It wouldn't have happened in part because so many of the participants, all of us, have minoritized, quote unquote, in different ways racial and cultural identities, all of us. No one expected all of us to be talking to each other. And that we are suggests that a new body is being formed. Something's happening right now. And it's beyond intersectional analysis, which suggests that meta intersectional analysis is not just methodological, it's not just theoretical, it's also practical. It's also being embodied right now. So one has to be fully present to the moment. Because if you, if you uh, fall asleep, you'll miss it. So I think we sagged a little bit, and I think that that's all right. Um, sometimes we start where we think we need to start around a particular topic, but it takes us to where we really want to go. That's the great benefit of, of a teacher. He has the question, but he knows that that's not the question. Mm -hmm. uh, that the asker of the question doesn't necessarily know that they even have a question or exactly what the question is, but the one who can perceive what is the deeper question um, can can make that can make that plain, and so we've been talking, you know. And I was asking when I first came, like I don't know why they invited me to this panel because that's this is not the place that, you know, I don't I don't hang out in the um, uh, so much in our um, uh, in the spaces where we are are different and struggling with a worldly wisdom to understand things. I hang out someplace different. If there wasn't someplace else to hang out, then I'd just do worldly things to the nth, and I wouldn't be trying to press into spiritual matters. So you have a worldly language and you have a spiritual language, and sometimes they're the opposite. So when the Buddha is talking about, uh, about birth, you know, uh, he's talking about dying. When he talks about death, he's talking about being born. And we're like, what's he talking about? That's why we don't understand half of this, because there's two different jargons you know, around two different, two different areas. Uh, and if we can make that transition you know, from all of these external things, you know, if I want to know about um, uh, just treating others like I want to be treated, 
you know, just that. I don't have to break it down into all of these things that we talk about, you know, just compassion, you know, wanting, not wanting to do to anybody else what I don't want done to me. You know, if we sat around the table and we just talk about that, now we're going to penetrate and get to something real that we can't, can't um, you know, wrap up in our fancy words and our intellectualism just leaves you nowhere to go but to dig deep mm -hmm. into the flesh. I need to treat you like I want to be treated. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't do anything to you that I wouldn't want done to me. You know, even if I make a mistake, I'm looking for mercy. So when you make a mistake, offering you mercy. Mm -hmm. You know, so we need to keep it elementary because that's the only way we're going to go deep. When we start swinging in the rafters, we're like just regurgitating concepts and opinions and ideas. But if we just take it down to the ground and we start at ground level, it's nowhere to go but to cut into the flesh. Mm -hmm. And so that's why we don't get there, you know, because we keep it with heady, high words swinging in the rafters. To go there is to be a little bit too real. To go there is to really touch someone in their inward parts, to go there is to tear down the, the lines of demarcation between me and between you. Mm -hmm. To go there, I can't keep alive this notion of racism. To go there, I can't keep alive a sense of a separation. Mm -hmm. You know, so a lot of times we're talking about not wanting to be separated, but yet we keep the conversation around separation going, mm -hmm. you know. And so the only way we're going to get somewhere is that we have to drop our lines of separation and just start at ground level and cut and cut deep. When we want to have that kind of conversation, then, you know, then I'm interested because it takes it out of an academic realm into an experiential, experiential realm. Mm -hmm. um, so many of the things that we talked about today, they're okay to talk about, you know, but they're out here, they're like worldly things, right? They really are. So when the Buddha's talking about uh, getting to this pe place within your practice, the whole purpose of practice being to take you to where you uproot yourself from the, the I-ness throne, mm -hmm. getting off the throne of the self, but there is something on the other side of that. What is that? You know, you need to penetrate to what that to what that is. You know, so we talk about meditation, we talk about concentration, we talk about, you know, single pointed awareness, we talk about all of these things. But what after that? That's like a doorway. You don't just go in the doorway and stay. You penetrate to the other side and you find out what's on the other side of that. There's something on the other side. And if you don't think there is, then there's no point in embarking on, on this journey. You know, but if you do think there is, you have to stay with it until you get to the other side and see. He said, I can't even describe it to you. It has to be known directly, but I can tell you this, it can be known. And until Western Buddhism starts moving towards that, we're, we're going to just be having conferences and panels and talking mm -hmm. and, and all of that because that's going to take some real, some real, pra some real practice. Mm -hmm. So I, actually, I thank you. I thank you for your question. Because when one is, is disembodied, one's not in touch, you know, with themselves, ain't nowhere to go with that. You know, who am I gonna talk to? A ghost? You know, it's nowhere to go. It's nowhere to go with that, right? And so one has to turn in and find oneself. But when you find yourself, then you find me. Because I'm no different than you. you know? There may be a difference in color, you know, but I'm no different than you. And penetrating to that level, that's the beginning of spirituality. And it's just as real as science. Yeah? Okay. I'd like to respond to the question a little bit too and maybe raise a question around it. Uh, at least for me, one, of, one type of embodied practice that is I'm very interested in and I try to cultivate is um, expanding the, the range of my understanding beyond the intellectual, beyond the academic, beyond the cognitive, 
into the realm of what we know through our bodies. And in particular, in the question of interacting and communicating with other people, uh, what we know uh, by virtue of what we say to each other, and also I'm interested in what we know by virtue of how our bodies are signaling. And so my own personal experience in the Tibetan Buddhist world is that I found early on in the teachers that I was studying with, I was often reprimanded because of my bodily etiquette. Mm. And I learned, uh, I was accused of having been born in a field, which means having been <laughs> born without any education when um, I you know, didn't know certain types of etiquette of how to, mm acknowledge how to show respect uh, to other people in a particular room. In particular, I and some of my other uh, Western colleagues were accused of having heavy butts or heavy asses because we were too attached to the chair that we were sitting on and we, didn't, we weren't able to easily stand up whenever it was time to stand up and to, to bow to someone, to acknowledge someone, or also to help someone. And I feel very much that part of my education in the Tibetan Buddhist world was learning types of bodily movement and part types of bodily acknowledgement, ways also of eye contact, of physical contact, and so on. I think those are really various. And I think it's sometimes, for me at least, is one of the challenges when you are interacting with people who are different than you, that sometimes certain cues are missed. Mm -hmm. So th this is where I would like to get back to the question you were just raising about uh, thinking, you know, I don't want to do to others as I wouldn't want to be done to me, which also implies having a sense of what others might want. It, do you ever have the experience of because of perhaps cultural difference mm -hmm. or different sets of styles of embodiment that sometimes one error makes a mistake mm -hmm. or doesn't, so this is to raise the, sometimes the difficulty of knowing how we're the same and sometimes it's very much about bodily types of stuff. I think it's not so much a sense of what others might want, it's a sense of knowing what I want. And a lot of times we don't know what it is that we want, that's why we don't know what others want. Uh, but once I know, when I'm very firm about what it is, that how, how I can recognize the, um, how I can recognize courtesy, how I can recognize forgiveness, how I can recognize, the, the ways that I recognize it if I just operate in that, that is the truth for me. And that kind of heart flows, flows over. Sometimes um, I understand what you mean about that, that kind of training. It's like in my center, uh, like if you're, uh, we're not used to, from the time we're young to the time we're old, we're not used to squatting, so we have difficulty sitting on pillows, but yet we're trying to sit on pillows because you know you look more you look more Buddhist that way. And so <laughs> so their legs get tight and they need to stretch them out. Now I don't say we well, don't point your, your feet at the teacher, that's considered disrespectful. You know, I just let them straighten out and say, like, you can do that in here, but if you go someplace else, then don't do it because I don't want them to think I'm raising baby's kids. You know, so just I, I just let them know so they can figure out another the way to do it differently that won't seem to be disrespectful. But I've had many Tibetan Rinpoches come to my center. When they first come, they're offended. They're offended because we don't have a long line of people giving flowers, you know, giving hearts. I'm like, I don't have time for that. I'm too busy. And, you know, I don't have anybody even giving them to me. But, but he said, well, I don't feel like I'm welcome here. And I said, if you weren't, you would not be here. You are definitely welcome. And I'm glad you're here. It's just we don't have time to do, do all of that. But after two or three days, they come back and say, oh, this was a wonderful experience. You know, people were, I didn't have to like act a certain way, I didn't have to be a certain way, I didn't have to do, I could just really be free. I said, you know, you could be all the time if you taught people, you know, how to be, how to be free, you know. The, you know, he said, but they have these expectations and they only have them because we give them to them, you know, and if we didn't do that, 
you know, and it doesn't mean, you know, that, that we don't recognize respect because we do. But when respect comes, you want it not an enforced respect, you know, but, but a genuine, genuine respect. So just like those kids that used to call me nigger when they started living with me, by the time, you know, they went through some time with me, there was a respect that they, that they developed for me through my thought, speech, and action. You know, and that's what brought about the change. I could have never said, don't say this or don't say that, you know. Uh, it would have been null and void. But, you know, whatever respect they wanted to offer, you know, they, they, they did. And so they changed, but they changed by me not demanding anything of them. Because whether you give it to me or not doesn't, doesn't really matter that much to me. You know, I just need to know who I am. When I don't, then maybe I'm going to get nervous and I'm going to come and make a demand on you. You know, and so, so it's ways like that. If we took everything, like right down to its root level like that, we'd start to be making progress. Again, studying the Dharma is not, you know, that's not the work. It's cultivating the, the behaviors that are based on the mindset However we think and ponder, that's the inclination of our mind. What do you think and ponder on? That's it. Thank you uh, for that question on embodiment and the answers that we have gotten. Um, I would just say that my first conscious awareness, ancestors in me, happened when I was a nun. And I was all ready to roll up my sleeves and pick up the pen and want to write the story that I shared with you earlier today about the headscarf. And I was all ready and excited. I said, okay, I'm gonna write this. This was gonna be published in our local magazine. And I had a piece of paper and nothing was happening. And I said, what, what? Put the pen down. What came in? The ancestors said, no, baby. That's not the way we tell stories. <laughs> it doesn't go from your head to your hand. It goes from our heart. That's the path. So if you want to write this story, you got to tell it. It has. We come from an oral tradition. Oh, OK. Now, the good thing was I listened to that. And I found a sister, sister, this is a strange request, but will you sit down and listen to a story so that I could, it could process from all this and through this channel called a hand and an arm and a pen. And it was such a, a riveting experience. It, it opened up those parts of me that I can name and those parts of me that I cannot name to what comes with what I'm already embodied with, but which forget which are the ancestors. The ancestors, your ancestors, my ancestors, our ancestors, all the same. It's one. And listening and continue to cultivate the practice of listening. And when I would be in a different place, when I went to uh, Africa for the first time as a nun, and put my feet on Mother Earth there, and what a blessing. But I also saw the doubt that I brought with it because what I was taught not good enough. And yet I saw all these beautiful black people who were running a country. This was incongruent. But it was there. And I listened. 
I went to England and realized, well, wait a minute, this is the land of my ancestors too. Now, how am I going to reconcile that? Because in one hand, they are the slaves, and the other hand, it's the slave masters. Am I going to be angry at one and try and heal the other? Not possible. Not possible. So there were insights, you know, that were gathered there. And I'm so grateful that these things happened during a time that I was practicing, but it was many years before I really began to feel the fruit. And remembering when I'm having the difficult times to call on the practice and the breath and letting go, but also to call on my folk. And I'm, when I'm really needing assistance, I do this physical thing so that I can tap into it. And I just have this vision. I see it in others as well as myself. That when I need that deep support, when I need to embody everything that's available but forget most of the time it's there, I just kind of shrug my shoulders. And a thousand wings on either side mm -hmm. manifest. And it's a radiance. And I said, what is this? And the word that dropped in was effulgence. Mm. Mm. OK, y'all got my back. Mm. And tapping that and knowing and, do, and, and cultivating, continue to cultivate a practice to be in touch with the body in the body. Mm. Can I touch it? Can I remember to touch it? when I need it, that's the truest practice for me. Yeah, just, just briefly on your question of what happens when we try to act authentically and genuinely through the body towards each other, and then there's some kind of maybe clash. And, and I, I just wanna offer that this happens to me, or I also witness it a lot, <laughs> in case anyone else is feeling like, ooh, um, intimidated by the level of spiritual power that's on display. <laughs> 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 Um, but, all, but in the organizing world too, right? Like, so, so um, in different, both Ohlone ceremonies where, where I live in occupied Oakland and um, they have uh, Danza Azteca or like indigenous ceremony that happens in combination with demonstrations or protests or actions, often people will burn uh, plant medicine, so smudging with sage or burning copal or these kinds of things. And there was this really beautiful time once when a contingent of disabled organizers, uh, some of whom had allergies to any type of smoke, any type of incense, anything burned, got together with the indigenous groups and they decided to move forward together without burning the offerings, but incorporating all other aspects of the, of the practice. And it's not, it's very awkward. Like it's not easy because we all know that the legacy of genocide and colonization has repressed people's abilities to practice their spiritual traditions. And we don't want to be the people like coming with extra requests along those lines, anything that could possibly rhyme <laughs> with that type of violence, right? Or that type of entitlement. 
And so it's very vulnerable and tender for people whose bodies, also because of industrialized capitalism, have been poisoned mm -hmm. and sometimes cannot even have a tolerance for fragrances or smokes that are natural, you know? Like, this is just the effects of how we've been living out of alignment with the earth. The effects land differently on different people's bodies. So what I, what I hear in what's being offered, which I really appreciate, is like, yeah, we never know exactly what somebody else wants or needs. And that's why we have to remember and recultivate our practices of consent, our practices of inquiring. And it's hard because like I always say, I want to be the type of person who always asks permission of the earth and never asks permission of the state. <laughs> right? Like those twin impulses live in me of, yeah, we're done asking permission for what to do what we know is right, right? From the from the systems in power. But at the same time, if we're not careful, that can calcify into a different type of entitlement, a different type of like, I'm right and I deserve this and I'm just gonna take it without asking. Um, so I don't even see the person who has the question. Oh, thank you for asking the question and yeah, I, I'm with you um, in it. The last thing I'll share is that, um, so in the, the Rinzai, tradition that I'm studying is practiced out of a Chosenji temple, which is co-founded by Omori Sogen and Tanoye Roshi um, in Hawaii. And it's really interesting there because they have a lot of embodied practices, as I was mentioning. And some of them involve shouting and hitting each other in the head with swords and things that, for my body at this moment, feel really good. <laughs> really, really good as a way of expanding beyond what's typically acceptable. And yet, right, like not everybody's body is in a space where yelling is useful or even really tolerable. And so there's also Tai Chi and Okyo or chanting and other ways of bringing vibrational healing and uh, study of dharma into the body, and particularly for folks who might be survivors of violence or in other ways, um, yeah, just not in a place where yelling and, and martial arts are useful, uh, there are, there's so much wisdom in these traditions that, again, has been um, invisibilized, in my experience, because of the Cartesian myth that this is what we are, right? Like, and that if we're very still that, and we're not in our bodies, then that's what discipline looks like. But yeah, no, everyone else on the earth is like, that's not what discipline is. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so thanks for the question again. So um, you made a comment about living uh, out of alignment for so long that we have all of these sensitivities and, and all of that. And I like, um, I so appreciate you because you take up some of the slack for me. Because if somebody, you know, comes and they has all of them, they need to do what they need to do to get into alignment instead of making everybody else, you know, have to um, fall into what they need, what they need to be comfortable. And that's part of this continued sense of entitlement you know, so if you come to, to like like my center, I have a, a I have a Western Dharma Hall. There's nothing in there because Westerners can't seem to tolerate anything. Then I have a, a Buddha Hall, and there we have flowers and we have um, candles. And then I have a Vajra Hall, and we have flowers and we have candle and we have incense and we have statues and we have different things. So you can whichever one makes you feel whichever one makes you feel comfortable. You know, but when uh, my Buddha, my biggest Buddha is an Afrocentric Buddha. Uh, a nun uh, sculpted it for me as a gift for her, her ordination. I did not make it. It is not me. But I have to admit that it looks, it looks, it's Afrocentric and it looks 
female, you know. And I, I call that the unknown Buddha. That's almost to all the, the unknown Buddhas in the 10,000 directions. And so that's the central figure on the, in the Vajra Hall. But I'm gonna tell you, when a Tibetan comes in, he like, he, they almost go crazy. You know, one told me he was scared of it. And I said, why? He said, because it doesn't look like a Buddha. I said, well, every one of your Buddhas that I looked at, looked at was Tibetan. I said, he, Buddha wasn't a Tibetan. You know, so if I look at a, Chi, uh, in China, look at, that's a Chinese looking Buddha. If I'm in India, it's an Indian looking Buddha. If I'm in Thailand, it's a Thai looking Buddha. I'm black. And so, <laughs> So I was happy that somebody, I would never have made it, you know, but that, she said, this, this um, being came and sat for me. I was making, she's a well-known sculptor, and she said, I was making a, a traditional sculptor, and she appeared, and she sat, she sat for me. And, uh, and so that was a, a channel by which uh, some, um, Inspiration came, you know, came to me. So I consider her a guardian of, of you know, Hartwood and the things that we're doing. So why should I? They said, well, it's okay to have her, but put her over in, in that corner. You know, because they want me to have a, a Tibetan or a Thai. I mean, when the Sri Lankans came, when they saw it, it scared them so bad, they sent me a, a five-foot <laughs> Buddha from, from uh, Sri Lanka, which I appreciate, it's in the Buddha hall. But, you know, and so, you know, we are, are too much caught up on the symbols, you know, that we're not penetrating deep enough into these, into the, you know, into the, in, the intricacies of the Dharma, uh, where the Dharma is taking us. And this is what I would hope that uh, we move more towards in Buddhism. That's why people like Tibetan Buddhists, and that's why they, they like, you know, uh, Thai, because they're, they're going deep, they're not going wide, you know. And so if we can start going deep, you know, then a, a lot of these questions or things that appear to be issues, we'll see that they're, they're not an issue. They're not an issue at all because we can penetrate them. And we also have the strength to hold and carry them and operate differently in our persons so that we transform just by virtue of who we are, not what we enforce upon others. You know, and that's a whole different level of practice. Let's get some other, the, in the back you had a question and you actually have the mic already. Is it working? Okay. Um, thank you again so much for your responses. Um, it was so wonderful to have the breadth of response that y'all gave. Um, and my original question, when your question was posed, um, when I'm not able to practice, and I'm not able to feel my ancestors, and I'm not able to feel embodied because I am disembodied, and not because I'm attached to materialism or my vulnerability, but because I'm literally dissociated, experiencing depersonalization, um, which is someone who's experienced many traumas, um, have many contested identities in this country, in this now, um, and obviously talk a lot. <laughs> um, it's not, I can't get my mind to do the thing and practice can't happen because I'm not in my body. The I exists somewhere over there. I, it's not even like feeling the ouch of pain. I, I wish I could feel pain because that's just not how depersonalization works. That's not how dissociation works. Mm -hmm. So my direct question was if any of you I can speak to that um, experience of trauma, uh, dissociation, when you can't be in your body, you can't sit because you have no body to, to be in, to ask for it to practice, to ask for the answers to show up for. I can't feel, hear, sense any of my ancestors when I'm feeling dissociated, when I am dissociated, which is a great sadness for me. <laughs> like I, I would want so much to just feel the pain of having heartbreak, but I can't even get to that place, you know? Mm -hmm. um, so if anyone could speak to that, that'd be awesome, thank you. Anyone on our panel would like to respond? I'll just say simply, some things are better caught than they are taught, you know, and it would be useful to be in a one-on-one uh, a -on -one, uh, type of uh, a, uh, relationship with a teacher, you know, like going to, and there are not that many places that have them, we do have it, but where you can uh, have someone who's working with you um, as you go through your process of reconnecting and getting back 
and getting back in your body. It's not a thing that's going to come by virtue of your head, you know, but it, it, it takes, uh, um, how, can I, how can I say this? Um, a, it's like a retrieval process. And one who can be in bilocation can be with you and help retrieve that and bring that back to you and bring that back into your into your body. We see it a lot with cancer patients and people who are experiencing a lot of, of pain uh, and they're out completely outside outside the body. Uh, so there is a process for um, getting back in, but it's not going to come through the head. Uh, there needs to be someone that you can be with that, that helps guide. Um, I, my question was to Dr. Harris mm -hmm. about um, teaching mindfulness in an AME church. How did you how do you, you uh, bring in mindfulness to the church, and have you seen resistance from it because it's not technically part of the Judeo Christian tradition? Mm -hmm. And I kind of want to know more about how you actually like practically implement mindfulness in a space that's normally African American. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Thank you for the question. I do not teach mindfulness in the AME church. We teach yoga at a Baptist church. Um, and that's, uh, for those who are familiar with the uh, varieties in African-American Christian Protestant church tradition, there is a vast difference uh, between AME doctrine and Baptist doctrine. Um, it is significant that the Baptist church is also in Texas. Uh, this is Friendship West Baptist Church. And I do not actually teach the class, but yoga is taught. Um, yoga in the sense of one of the experiences that came out of um, Eric Gardner and the movement of recognizing that the I can't breathe that he was uttering, um, literally that air was being choked out of his mouth, met for many of us, um, it was a call for those of us who do practice meditation to recognize the importance of the breath and restoring the breath, literally the ability to breathe. Um, clean air, uh, which goes into environmental justice work, but clean air, but literally the ability to breathe, particularly for African American peoples. Um, at that time, moving through police brutality, attack after attack after attack, trauma after trauma after trauma. It opened up for us the conversation about post-traumatic stress disorder that many African Americans and many peoples of African descent walk around with daily, um, but are afraid or unaware that they're moving through and moving with trauma. This kind of consciousness has only come as a result of us being able to see an African Christ, a black Christ, an Afrocentric kind of spirituality and black liberation uh, theology. It has not come through an understanding of Christianity that's been passed down um, that looks white, that is to say a white Christ, um, or a practice of white Protestant Christianity. Um, so I just want to clarify that part first. Um, These questions are very much alive for people. And I, I love the language that we were using earlier in terms of process. Everyone is in process. Uh, when I, this is a different space, when I teach not in the church setting, but when I teach in, a, in an academic setting, um, and this speaks to your point about how fluid oftentimes teachers have to be because we have to have the pedagogical tools to be able to teach Sangha, to be able to teach in a black Baptist church, and to be able to teach at Harvard. Um, that necessitates, um, I think for me, in the, in the classroom, there's a bit more freedom to be able to invite students to link into the scientific benefits of the neurological um, resting of one's mind, in part because working with students who are very, very busy and often overworked, it's the one two minute time in their day that they can breathe. The consistent pattern here is the breath. 
Um, if one teaches mindfulness in any classroom, I do believe that they're on the right path, meaning that breath is, uh, restoring the breath is the work, no matter where it's being done. And sometimes social justice is teaching someone how to read. And sometimes social justice, the most radical racial justice one can do, gender justice one can do, sexual justice one can do, is teaching someone how to breathe again. That doesn't necessarily mean that one needs to memorize the scriptures. So these questions are very much alive for many of our members. Um, for those who practice yoga for the first time, they just like coming back to the yoga class and they're glad that it's offered at our church because they feel better afterwards. They don't know about Buddhism. If you told them they were, there was a link between yoga and Buddhism, they would not come to yoga. So again, I think this speaks to the um, fluidity of the wisdom um, that all of us are, you know, blessed to tap into, um, and and the challenge um, of of the construction of multiple belongings, and yet the reality of multiple belongings, even as these uh, divisions between race. Um, et cetera, et cetera. Even as in Buddhist thought, they're falling away and they do not exist. The self does not exist, no self, emptiness. Those of us who cannot breathe also recognize that in the woman's tongue, if you don't love the self, baby, you, you're not gonna get very far. So the emptiness or no self doesn't necessarily compute directly, doesn't necessarily translate directly. So one, oftentimes in womanist circles and some of the work that we've done together um, has invited many womanist scholars and activists uh, here to Harvard and other places together. And one of the first questions that was asked was coming to a place of emptiness and releasing the self, releasing the ego. And someone said, uh -uh, I'm not releasing myself. <laughs> I fought too hard to get to myself, to love the self, and to love her fiercely. That's the job. That's what I'm supposed to be doing. No, 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 baby, you're not going to take myself away. I worked too hard to get here back and free. Um, and this is one of the challenges, I think, of comparative constructive theologies, but also comparative religious thought and interfaith and inter and interreligious dialogue. There is some translation that we still need to work on, and I think it's um, precisely these moments that you, that you all were both lifting of kind of cultural disconnect, where one is not dancing in step with the other, or one's physical body and the energy shifts between one body and another, a kind of cultural disconnect. That's oftentimes what's happening in that moment. Um, so I, I think what I would just end with to give you some <laughs> wisdom. Um, it can be done, but it, it's not always done, at least in my experience of African-American Christian black tradition, by saying we are now going to enter the path of Buddhism and Buddha is going to talk to Jesus and Jesus is going to be with the Holy Spirit. You, it, I, I have found in my own work that it's better to go with praxis, an experiential opportunity to help black people breathe, just to help them breathe. Okay. And Romans 8, the good I would do, I don't do what I don't want to do, I do, oh, wretched man am I, starting right there with that kind of mind. You know, and as you start unpacking that mind, so that that's what Buddhism helps us to do, do what we want to do and don't do what we don't want to do. Uh, and that was the segue for me. Like, I, I get the whole thing, the whole holy thing. It's just that, that when I would do good, evil was with me. You know, and so he, uh, that's a great entryway for mindfulness for, for Christians because they all know that mind that, like, says, you know, hold me back, hold me back, hold me back instead of just stopping. You know. Okay, yeah. We have one up here.
Um, so speaking to um, embodiment and also disembodiment and how those things happen. My heart's beating really fast right now. Um, so, okay, where do I begin? A, a first thing is that um, hearing you speak about being able to go to the root and not do like a lot of intellectualization and to, and how that leaves you, the, the only place that leaves you is to go into the body and, and cut into the body um, and how we can get really caught in like worldly things and, and all of that. And I'm a person who really struggles with that um, and who entered spirituality as a way to escape the world and escape my body, like seeing my body as part of the worldly things that I'm trying to escape because it didn't feel safe. Um, and hearing what you're saying and it like really resonating that like there's a certain amount of like fearlessness that needs to happen um, to really get to the root of the things if I really want liberation, which is what I want. Um, but then also grieving that it doesn't feel accessible to me in part because of the ways in which people have weaponized the things that you were saying to tell me that um, in ways that actually endangered my body physically um, by saying that like racism doesn't like land in the body and live in the body and like all of those things. And so I'm sitting with that and like was sitting up with a lot of resistance that was coming up in me when you were speaking mm -hmm. at the same time as like a lot of resonance um, and just like sitting in that conflict. Um, and so I guess in also thinking about disembodiment, it felt hard, hard for me, like in, in hearing your question too, um, that like, I don't know, I'm struggling because I feel like even when I'm disembodied, like that can be practiced too. Um, and that like return is only possible if disembodiment happens too. Um, like that that's, that's part of this, the turning. Um, yeah, and, I, and I'm just, I'm thinking about embodiment and I'm thinking about being called to be embodied um, and to drop these other things, but those other things make it really hard for me to be in my body. And so sometimes hearing this call to be embodied as like this call to endanger my, myself, um, and then experiencing times where I've like forced myself into my body um, and like re-traumatized myself be because of like forcing myself to be in my body when it was actually not safe for me to be in my body. Mm -hmm. um, and so, I'm having trouble formulating a question, but you all have great wisdom. <laughs> um, yeah, and so I guess I'm, I'm just really struggling with or maybe grieving um, maybe sitting with, yeah, maybe I'm just sitting, sitting with that grief of, of what it means to be called to be embodied um, when these things that like do live in intellectualization, like actually like land on my body all the time. Um, and like not knowing how to release and like trust that I'll be caught or even quite frankly that I will live um, if I drop those things. So thank you for sharing. Um, sometimes, you know, this is a gradual it's a gradual path. And sometimes it's like just dipping your toe in and finding that there's no danger in the water. You know, you just dip your toe in and then you step back out to your place of safety. And then gradually, gradually, one finds uh, uh, their location in the Dharma. 
You know, and so the, the Dharma is not anything that demands, but it is easy to be in, in treated. Uh, and everyone's um, progress uh, uh, is personal. We talk about no self, but he, he said, when did, when, did, when did I ever say that? When was that my doctrine? And it absolutely is his doctrine. You know, you go two pages over and say, when did I say that? You know, and so he, he's pointing towards a space that we get in, a neutral space, not to much on one side, not too much on the other, and that's a different spaces for different people, you know, so that's why it's so important to begin to know myself. I know I'm not safe, you know, in being in my body. That's where I start. That's not where I forever end up. I have to take times of crossing that divide mm -hmm. and then stepping back out until I find a place of comfort, a comfort in there, and that's why it takes having a relationship, you know, with a teacher who can help who can help you um, uh, bridge, you know, uh, bridge that in in your life? It's very difficult to get that through books or through uh, going, you know, to a sangha where you have a 45-minute dharma talk and 45 minutes sit and bye-bye. You know, it it takes uh, a kind of of ministry to bring about this kind of healing, and that's not what we have in. Western Buddhism, we don't have that kind of ministry to the whole person, you know, but I think it was what the Buddha was talking about because we can see it in other traditions that we have been a part of that have been rich for us so much so that we're longing for them, but we just don't want to go back to the, you know, outer containers, but there was something in it that we found that nurtured, you know, and brought healing, and we're trying to figure out how to graft that in, in, into this. You know, and so that is born out of our own experience. It's a matter of touching that experience again and finding safety. You know? I think we have an urgent question in the back, which is relevant to what we've just been saying. Uh, yeah. This is probably going to be the last question because we're almost at the end of our period, and then we'll have a brief break mm -hmm. and really then come back for some further conversation. Listening to you all talking about this um, disembodiment, I was thinking about um, these 12 step programs where people keep falling off the steps and going back on. It, it just seems to take forever if it, if it you know, does succeed. And I'm, I'm wondering if you all have dealt with um, a Buddhist model of, of dealing with these, um, you know, substance abuse types, of addictive type of um, behaviors and um, mindsets, and if you all could speak to that. Well, we have a, a twelve step at our at our center. And when I had originally envisioned it, I was going to call it the 13th step because I've never, I wasn't in the 12th step. And they said, oh, you can't call it the 13th step because that means something to anybody who's in 12, in 12 step programs. Y'all know what that 13th step is, right? So I couldn't use 13th step. But it's when we talk about being helpless and, you know, that we can't do this, we need an outside power. For me, the Buddhist 13th step was I'm not helpless and that I can do it with an intrinsic power, you know. And so I looked around for a program, but um, we found uh, three, I think, three Buddhist programs, and we use one of them right now, which is, which is refuge recovery. And uh, I would say uh, maybe... 20% uh, of my sangha started just coming to refuge recovery. But it was just a little bit of Dharma because they weren't Buddhists, mm -hmm. you know, but enough to make them uh, say, what else, you know, what else can I, I want to know more. And then they filtered over and became sangha members, but, you know, most of them were, were Christian or, or not. Just uh, so I know refuge recovery is, is good. Um, what's that, sister? She's got a program too. You Valerie, can, Valerie right? And Valerie uh, uh, has a has a great program as well. Yeah, 
Uh, Valerie? Eight step recovery. Eight step, right. Mm -hmm. So if you just Google Buddhist uh, recovery programs, it, they will come up for you. <laughs> 